I'm Gary Marcus. I'm a cognitive scientist and entrepreneur. Lately, I've been doing a lot of AI policy. You might have seen me speak to the U.S. Senate in front of Sam Altman. It is my great pleasure to be here today with Carl Friston. I will let him introduce himself, but I will say that in my former life as a psychologist and neuroscientist, the people worshipped Carl, and it's exciting to be here with him today. That's very gracious of you. Thank you very much. My name's Carl Friston. Um, I am a cognitive scientist, um, psychiatrist, or part physicist, uh, but not an entrepreneur. So it's a delight to sit with an entrepreneur. But now you're actually helping a, a company. Maybe oh, yeah. we'll, we'll get there. So, I mean, in some ways, we have similar paths. I think we've both been interested in how the mind works fundamentally. And for both of us, that has brought us to some degree into this artificial intelligence world. What I would like to see is a, a new form of AI that was based more on causality. And maybe we can talk a little bit about the stuff that you're up to. Um, where I think you are thinking a bit more about causality. The mainstream AI right now is not really about causality at all. You can sometimes get it to say something like A causes B because a bunch of humans have used those words. That doesn't mean the system actually understands. The system will get confused and say that two kilograms of feather weigh less than one kilogram of steel. Like it doesn't really know what these words mean. It doesn't really know what causality means. We're going to need a new breed of AI. I think you have some ideas about that. We probably need more ideas than the whole planet has collectively right now. Eventually, we'll have enough paradigms that we'll have an AI that can act more like a scientist than we have now. That's when I think it might be really helpful to neuroscience. When, when it can invent new ideas, which is not really in the scope of what we got now, you're approximating the data. You're not learning what actually causes those things. You do, is that your take? Did yeah. No, you, you've used all my favorite words there. You've talked about understanding causal reasoning, all of these things depend upon belief structures. Like, of course, if you haven't got a belief structure inherent in your AI architecture, you can't do any of these things to, you know, to understand is to have that mechanistic causal ability to reason through, I would say, infer, just because that's the, you know, the way you manipulate uh, belief structures. Um, so belief and uncertainty, I think, are super important. I don't think the current AI systems actually have beliefs. They are able to confuse naive users into thinking that they do so because um, humans are gullible and most aren't trained to think about cognitive psychology or causality or behavior in its relation to underlying mechanism. But I think you and I know they don't have beliefs. Why is it that we are so easily seduced into attributing, say, large language models with uh, the kind of reasoning, the kind of understanding um, you and I enjoy, um, even to the extent of you know talking about hallucinations. I mean, that's a very gracious attribute to to, to paper transform. Yes. Yeah, side <laughs> note: I'm responsible for that. I kind of oh, popularized that term. And on the plus side, it became the word of the year in 2023. I didn't know that. Um, but it's not a very good term, right? Because this hallucination still implies a level of belief and. It's a kind of personification. Yeah. We need a term for like, it just made that up. And the word that has stuck is hallucination. But you, as a psychiatrist, know what actual hallucinations it, are. It's not it's really the right term. But it, 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 is, a, it is a seductive term. It's, it's a stuck. It, it's, it's stuck. It's you know, I did it in a few interviews and it's read. And, but it's also a very fortuitous word because, you know, just to address the second point of your um, question about, you know, starting from very different positions, how, how did we end up in a very similar place? So hallucinations, of course, in, is one of the paradigmatic features of psychosis. So, you know, in my day job as a, um, a neuropsychiatrist, much of the motivation for the theoretical um, accounts of human brain function was motivated by, well, where do hallucinations come from? And can you understand that in the context of how a brain works, well, indeed, how any sort of sentient uh, self-organizing system works? Because at the end of the day, what is a, a, um, an hallucination? It is a false inference. It's either inferring something is there when it's not there. There's a whole other um, raft of uh, really quite crippling um, psychopathologies that are the reverse false inference type two errors. So inferring something is not there, it is. Both, I think, are um, pure examples of false inference. So what that tells you is that if you want to understand psychiatry um, and certain aspects of neurology from a clinical perspective, then you need to understand the role of inference in the brain. And of course, inference is just the reduction, it's just 
making moves in terms of information processing that resolve uncertainty, making your beliefs more precise, or in some instances realizing you didn't believe something, convictions were not quite as justified uh, as such. So we come back to exactly where we started, which is understanding is all about belief updating, using your or everything that you have available to you in a in an inactive way to get the right kind of data, content, sensory information, either from the outside Wikipedia or indeed from your own body, that resolves your uncertainty about the way that you work in, in your lived in your lived world. We don't really understand how the brain does inference in, in general, um, especially like if you think about logical reasoning and so forth. We know that the brain doesn't do it that well. Um, so people sometimes ask me to compare humans and AI. And my argument is we're not actually trying to imitate humans because there are a lot of problems in the inferencing that humans do. Um, my favorite example of this is confirmation bias. So we try to infer how the world is working, but we mostly pay attention to the evidence that supports our own beliefs. We tend to be dismissive of the evidence that doesn't. And that has terrible political consequences, right? That leads to polarization. People can't find any compromise. So the, there are some horrible flaws in human reasoning. And yet there's some stuff that actually works pretty well on a day-to-day -day basis. Like we don't routinely walk in front of cars. Like we, we pretty well get around the world most of the time. People will tell me, yeah, well, you say that the computer has an hallucination, but, but you know, people do too. And I'm like, yeah, but if you look at driving statistics, people have an accident like once every, or a fatal accident, like once every hundred million miles. Like they're not hallucinating other cars in front of them and slamming on the brakes routinely. So they have to, on the one hand, there are ways in which human inferencing actually works pretty well, like in routine, just navigating through the world. Then you have like these political things where confirmation bias is, is terrible. Um, and so like we want an AI system that's as flexible about inferencing as people, but without these flaws, like a lot of it, I think the flaws are really about ego. Like I think confirmation bias partly become, comes because we can't search our memories like a database can. And partly because I guess the other one, what did they call it? Um, motivated reasoning. Like, we really want to be right. We don't want to acknowledge the other because it's not good for our ego to acknowledge the wrong. So we have less like noise in the channel, but even with the noise in the channel, it's still better than any AI system um, that's out there in terms of like really being able to deal with the open-ended world and inferencing. And I look at all this and I'm like, humans are a low bar. It's gotta be possible to do better than this low bar. But then I'm frustrated, like, that the AI is not better than the low bar. Like, I really want to see it better. And I'm also frustrated that neuroscience doesn't really, like, I wish I could, like, look at a brain and say, these are the beliefs that this person has. Or, like, wouldn't it be great to have, you know, virtual assistants that talk directly to the brain and could, you know, be a step ahead of me? But we're not really there yet. I often think that machine learning has just got the wrong words in the title. This is not about learning, it's about inference. And let me ask you, do you think machine learning has got the right maths, the right ideology, the right calculus, the right uh, tools to address inference properly? It does learn beautifully, but can it do inference? I think that in fact, it does a subset of learning beautifully, but I mean, we know from cognitive psychology that there are actually many forms of learning there's observational learning and there's conditioning and so forth. And machine learning is doing kind of statistical correlation learning fabulously well over huge data sets. And that turns out to be much more useful than I think anybody reasonably could have imagined. But there are other things involved in learning that are more like logical inferences, like the kind of learning that you do when you learn physics or, or economics or something like that, where you're really learning new ideas. And I don't think that the current generation of AI is equipped to do that, to, to really learn abstractions and to be able to compose those abstractions into greater abstractions, which I think is the greatest pinnacle of human thought. Like, I don't think it's there yet. Um, people sometimes talk about like, do with this AI where a dog is? I think we're not even where a dog is because the, the dog can actually- you know, Bumblebee or? Bumblebees are actually pretty cool. I don't know <laughs> if you know the comparative literature there. This was a fantastic conversation. We should have another one. We should make this a ritual. Maybe next year in Davos or wherever we meet again, we can do a, a part two and we can look and see which has moved faster in between conversations, neuroscience or AI. We can make it a, a, a ritual. Does that sound good to you? That sounds a wonderful idea. We really enjoyed talking to you. Likewise, fantastic. Let's do it again.
Guys, that was great. I, I just want to know if we could take uh, this last question. Sean, right now the entire AI industry is largely focused really on what's described as AGI, so human-like intelligence. So Sam Altman and others are, are, are leaning into sort of super intelligence, the idea that the recursive agent is going to then become more intelligent than all humans. Carl, I, I think that, that we have a very different idea about what that term means. Super intelligence is not a, a sort of single agent that then self-recursively you know, grows to, to you know, beyond human intelligence. And I'd like to hear what Gary thinks about the vision that, that you put forth that, that, that we're wanting to back. The whole ways in which we workshop and develop ideas as a society will change when there are no agents really genuinely contributing. Like, I don't know any real idea that has come out of GPT-4, right. unlike you know many newspaper columnists that I read that like genuinely interesting ideas are you reflecting, talking. And so, but eventually that, that will be common. Right. And like that will change the transmission of ideas and how we, you know, there's kind of marketplace of ideas and it will utterly disrupt that. And that's, you know, it's so wild and the crazy From thing. that point of view, it's, it's less about, um, well, interpolation that we see sort of LLMs and Gen AI doing, but truly, genuinely new creative things that then make us smarter. So super intelligence is more like a super organism of humans and agents. I think we should have networks of intelligence. Once we work out the safety issues, which we didn't talk about today, yeah. which keep me up at night and which are terrifying. Yes. Once we make real progress on the safety issues, yes. I think you know super intelligence could be a great thing. It could take us, you know, beyond the mediocre level of tribalism where we're stuck right now yeah. in society. And you know, I mean I think there's great potential there. I do think I'm not in a rush to have super intelligence because I think right now we're way over our skis. We don't really know how to make any of these things reliable, controllable, truthful, safe, etc. But if we can get to an AI that can tick those boxes that should be minimum, then yeah, we could have like an intellectual playmate that could be amazing.